Welcome back, folks. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the distal radius, and I'll take you through uh, everything from uh, the initial patient presentation all the way to uh, a case of open reduction and internal fixation. Special thanks to Dr. Mark Snotty. He's one of my co-residents uh, uh, for a lot of the material presented in this slide. A uh, roadmap of today's talk, we're going to start initially with epidemiology, work our way over to anatomy, and then talk about classification briefly, and then talk about uh, definitive and uh, initial management. Uh, as a uh, junior resident on call, even fourth-year medical students, this uh, part even is pertinent to you guys, uh, you're going to see a page come across that says emergent consult. It's, a, in this case, 55-year-old gentleman uh, involved uh, in a motorcycle crash. Uh, and you call back and they say, hey, we've got somebody who's got a wrist fracture. Uh, there are a few things you should uh, want to know about any fracture pattern uh, uh, initially, and that is, is this an open injury? Because it has implications for antibiotics and uh, likely will need to go to the OR for some sort of debridement. And then the other thing is, uh, is there any concern for compartment syndrome? And that applies to most fractures. The subtlety here is that there's a, a acute carpal tunnel syndrome that you have to worry about. And that is uh, uh, after a fall on an outstretched hand or any kind of distal radius fracture that uh, ends up uh, occurring, uh, the fracture fragments can end up uh, sometimes in the carpal tunnel. Uh, sometimes there's a extensive hematoma in there, and that compresses the median nerve. Uh, median nerve damage can then cause paresthesias uh, and uh, pain in the uh, median nerve distribution, so you have to be particularly cautious of that. And so the purpose of what I'm telling you now is um, in these distal radius fractures, uh, have a suspicion uh, and think about acute carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, although the case here is a motorcycle crash, a lot of these injuries are actually uh, sustained by older women and are low energy, usually uh, mechanism is a fall on an outstretched hand. Uh, the high energy ones, such as the case I'm talking about now, uh, is uh, usually intraarticular and uh, high energy. Although that's about, uh, I would certainly say, less than 20% of the, uh, the cases and not the norm. Uh, after you uh, hear about the consult, make sure there are radiographs, orthogonal views, so AP lateral shown there. Uh, and they show a volarly displaced extraarticular distal radius fracture. And so initially when you're looking at a distal radius, uh, things that are important are, uh, is this uh, intraarticular or extraarticular? Uh, is the fracture pattern simple or comminuted? And then uh, is this uh, dorsally displaced or volarly displaced uh, fracture pattern? So joint involvement, fracture pattern, and then displacement direction are sort of helpful descriptors right off the bat. Obviously, you're going to examine the patient. That's sort of a dinner fork deformity that you're going to see uh, in these cases. And so think about uh, how you would go about managing something like this for some of you younger uh, uh, folks in training. Uh, epidemiology of uh, distal radius fractures is one of the most common fractures uh, seen uh, both by orthopedic surgeons and even in the ER. Uh, almost one out of every six fracture treated in the ER uh, and seen in the ER is uh, going to be a distal radius fracture. Uh, Rockwood and Green's latest edition is actually saying that there's almost greater than 600,000 cases per year of this fracture pattern. Uh, this 450,000 one is from another source, probably perhaps a little outdated. Just like anything in trauma, uh, if, uh, if there's a bimodal distribution, young folks and old folks, young folks usually sustain this fracture after a high energy mechanism and then falls, uh, usually a low energy mechanism in older folks will uh, result in this fracture. Um, interestingly, as the population gets older um, and they are remaining more active, they tend to preserve their reflexes. And so older folks who are still semi-conditioned and still in shape uh, are still uh, conditioned enough to be able to put their hand out in front of them right before they fall, and so they'll sustain a distal radius fracture. Uh, interestingly, if you've got really uh, uh, sort of deconditioned folks, they're not going to uh, be able to react in time, and they usually end up falling directly on their shoulder and end up uh, with a proximal humerus fracture. Uh, the usual way in, in which these fracture patterns occur are uh, there's tension on the volar side and so it's a tension related fracture of the volar cortex and then a comminution on the dorsal side so the dorsal side fails in compression and the volar side fails in uh, tension. 
look at the anatomy of the distal radius. The top left shows the dorsal surface, and uh, you can see Lister's tubercle there. EPL wraps around that from ulnar to radial. Uh, and then top right uh, shows you sort of the volar surface of the distal radius. And pay particular attention to the palmar ulnar corner, uh, as this is sort of the keystone of the radius. It's the strongest uh, bone that sits right underneath that uh, palmar ulnar uh, cortex. And whenever you see a fracture pattern through this area, and by the way, this area is called a critical corner, it has implications for treatment because if you don't restore that corner, uh, the carpus can actually end up falling down into that depression. Um, and so there, there's also a ligament, the uh, stout volar radiolunate ligament, very strong uh, radiocarpal ligament that attaches along that critical corner and goes up to the carpus. And so if that piece is down and depressed, you better bet that that carpus is going to kind of come along with the depressed segment and, and uh, this is going to have implications for motion and pain if you don't restore it. Uh, if you look at the bottom left, you're going to see uh, uh, the scaphoid fossa and the lunate fossa. It's separated by a, a bony ridge. And the lunate fossa, if that's smashed down, that's usually called a die punch fracture. Uh, the sigmoid notch is where the distal ulna articulates with the distal radius. In the neutral position, about 80% of the weight goes through the radius, and then about 20% goes through the ulna. Here's uh, an anatomy slide from um, Dr. Netter's uh, uh, collection, and it shows that there's an extensive network of uh, radiocarpal ligaments. Uh, the take-home messages here are the volar radiocarpal ligaments are stronger than the dorsal ones, and the dorsal ones have more slack built into them because they're more of a Z pattern, uh, whereas the volar ones are more of a straight pattern of the ligaments. And so when you pull axial traction to reduce some of these fractures, you're going to end up uh, being able to pull more along the dorsal side uh, because of the way the tissue is uh, than you are on the volar side. A big deforming force uh, is the brachioradialis. It attaches along the radial styloid. and so. Uh, as you're pulling axial traction, that styloid piece is going to be deformed, deformed by it. Uh, I do want to talk about a concept called ligamentotaxis, and this is the idea whereby you're pulling traction and you're exploiting ligamentous attachment. Uh, and, and specifically, so if you're pulling traction, you're going to, that traction is going to go down into the tissue and the ligaments are going to get stretched and any bone that's attached to those ligaments is also going to get pulled. And so you can use this uh, concept to help you get a reduction, as long as the bone fragments have some kind of tissue attachment to them. Obviously, for any sort of free pieces, ligamentotaxis isn't going to do much for you. Eponyms, uh, I like to personally just describe the fracture, dorsally displaced, intraarticular, so on and so forth. But uh, you will see these uh, uh, used in literature and uh, so on. Colley's fracture is a, a dorsally displaced extraarticular fracture named after Abraham Colley's, who was a, uh, a prominent surgeon uh, around the late 1700s. The Smith fracture is the reverse. It's a volarly displaced uh, uh, extraarticular distal radius fracture. Then you have the Barton fracture. The Barton fracture is a uh, articular fracture uh, of the radius, and then the uh, radial carpal joint is subluxed. So you can have a dorsal or a volar. Uh, Barton's fracture. And that's named after John Barton, who was an American surgeon in the mid 1800s. Uh, finally, a chauffeur fracture is uh, named after chauffeurs who used to, in the early 1900s, crank start their car, and the crank would then kick back and then hit their wrist and then cause a, a fracture of the radial styloid. And so, a radial styloid fracture is usually a chauffeur fracture. Uh, and that has a, a higher association with an SL, scaphalunate ligament tear as well, so have a higher suspicion when you see a radial styloid fracture. Classification systems are always helpful in orthopedics when they uh, form the basis of treatment and prognosis. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of a distal radius, there's really no great uh, system that's caught on. Uh, Anderson et al. A group uh, showed that there was poor inter and intra-observer reliability of this classification system. Uh, the OTA classification is helpful for research purposes, but um, in the distal radius world, you can probably uh, get away with just describing the fracture pattern and uh, that, that'll uh, be perfectly adequate. 
When you see these folks, uh, part of the physical exam, make sure to do a neuro neurovascular exam. Do a two-point discrimination test. So you can use a paper clip and a normal two-point discrimination uh, along the volar surface of the digits is uh, about five millimeters. And so you can set a paper clip about five millimeters apart and uh, test for two-point discrimination. Uh, and then after you do your reduction, check the two-point discrimination again if you're worried about uh, paresthesia is getting worse and the two-point discrimination getting worse, uh, you may be worried about acute carpal tunnel. If, however, the two-point discrimination is getting better and the exam is overall improving, then your suspicion for uh, acute carpal tunnel syndrome should be going down. Uh, obviously, look at the radial pulse. The skin integrity is important. Um, some of these elder folks will have thin skin, folks on steroids or folks on any kind of anticoagulants will sort of be very prone to... Uh, damage in and around their soft tissue structures. Um, uh, be cognizant of that when you're reducing these uh, fractures. As you pull sort of vigorously, you may end up tearing, and uh, uh, you're, you're going to have to uh, deal with uh, uh, blood pooling in and around the reduction site because the patient may be on Coumadin or, or what have you. Uh, make sure you look at the skin also for any kind of open injury. If these injuries are going to be open, uh, they usually occur along the volar uh, ulnar side, and that's where the ulna kind of buttonholes out. Associated injuries, the, the SL ligament is injured in about 5% of uh, all coming distal radius fractures. And then uh, you, you particularly want to think about the SL ligament being injured in uh, the case of a radial styloid fracture. Any kind of TFCC uh, injury, uh, can be heralded by an ulnar styloid fracture. So if you see an ulnar styloid fracture, be concerned that the dorsal and volar uh, radial ulnar ligaments may be disrupted. Uh, imaging, uh, make sure to obtain orthogonal uh, radiographs. So AP lateral oblique is sometimes helpful if you can't see the uh, fracture pattern uh, appropriately. Uh, get an image of the contralateral wrist because that will show you what the ulnar variance and what the... Uh, radial height is normally, and you can use that to compare uh, when you're intraoperatively struggling to reduce uh, a distal radius fracture. A CT scan isn't, isn't ordered routinely, but you can order it in cases where there's extensive comminution to help you come up with a preoperative plan. Or sometimes uh, if uh, you've just got a radial styloid fracture that you think is reduced, but uh, uh, sometimes the AP view can be deceptive. It can look reduced, but it, in reality, it may be malrotated. And so the CT scan can help you understand whether it's uh, appropriately reduced or not. Uh, when you're looking at radiographs, uh, there are several established parameters. And so you can use these parameters as a guideline for whether you need to operate or not. Uh, make sure to look at the joint in any case. Uh, here's an AP of the wrist. And uh, if you've got significant articular step off, certainly greater than two millimeters, that's one vote towards operative management. Um, le let me go through a, a variety of these uh, radiographic parameters. The first one being uh, radial inclination. And so you draw a line perpendicular to the radial shaft, and then you uh, draw a line from the ulnar margin of the articular surface all the way to the radial margin of the articular surface. And this measurement's usually around 22, 23 degrees. The next measurement is radial height. And this measurement is taken from a line drawn perpendicular to the shaft along the tip of the radial styloid. And then interestingly here, along the uh, articular surface of the ulna. And this will give you a sense of what the radial height is. It's usually about 11 millimeters. Next parameter is a variance, and variance is, in my mind, I use it to understand where the ulna uh, sits in general. So when I'm reducing this distal radius and my ulna is 5 millimeters or, or 10 millimeters uh, depressed, I know that my reduction is inappropriate. Or if my ulna is actually longer than my uh, distal radius, then I know that I've probably malreduced the fracture. But when you talk about ulnar variance, most folks will have an ulna that has an articular surface that sits almost at the level of the ulnar distal radius articular surface. It's usually neutral ulnar variance. Um, and then 
or the ulna will be in negative uh, variance. What you don't want is positive ulnar variance uh, because that'll end up leading to uh, the wrist smashing into the distal, distal ulna and causing uh, ulnocarpal abutment and pain in that area. This is where uh, an image of the contralateral wrist is helpful to get you an understanding how high your ulna normally sits. The final uh, parameter is volar tilt, and this is about 11 degrees, and it's a line uh, that's drawn perpendicular to the radial shaft on the lateral view. And then the second line is a uh, line from the volar lip all the way to the dorsal lip of the uh, distal radius, and this is about uh, 11 degrees or so. If you can remember the number 11, that's a helpful number because that's volar tilt, that's radial height, and then you double it and you get your radial inclination. Uh, again, showing you another way to, I mean, it's the same way to calculate radial height and all in our variance, just shown in a close-up projection. When you see these folks in the ER, uh, do a hematoma block, and that's uh, uh, where you take uh, lidocaine or marcaine or some kind of local anesthetic and inject it directly into the fracture site after you sterilely prep the skin and ask for uh, about allergies. Uh, the reduction that your goal is to reduce the fracture and splint the fracture stabilize it temporarily. So do this with uh, uh, Marcaine if you'd like, which lasts about two to three longer than lidocaine. Um, the caveat here is you don't want to dump a whole bunch of local anesthetic that's long acting in a case where you're worried about acute carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, so do your hematoma block. Uh, walk away for a little while after you've put these uh, wrists in uh, finger traps, and finger traps are just uh, a way of allowing for muscle relaxation and allowing gravity to help you with the uh, reduction ahead of time before you get in there and aggressively manipulate the fracture. Uh, I like to put the index and the long finger in the finger traps because of the way the distal radius sits anatomically. You don't want to you don't want to pull the ulnar side uh, of the distal radius with the same force you do the radial side of the distal radius because of the way uh, of the radial inclination. So I leave the index and the long finger uh, in the finger traps uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes. You put a counterweight on the anterior brachium and you go and get your splint stuff set up. Uh, your splint uh, should be, th be about 8 to 10 uh, sheets thick. Make sure you use uh, lukewarm water. You don't want to use scalding hot water because the exothermic reaction can cause burns uh, around the skin. Make sure you appropriately pat it. And the plan is to use a um, sugar tong splint. A sugar tong splint comes from the distal palmar crease all the way down, around, and up along the uh, dorsal um, metacarpals. The most common mistake here is that folks will put a splint too distal, and it'll be distal to the distal palmar crease, and folks patients will not be able to flex their MCP joints. If you can't flex your MCP joint, that MCP joint is going to get stiff, and uh, this, is a, this is condemning your patient to further physical therapy and stiffness and just a poor outcome when you re really don't need one. Um, err on the side of uh, having this uh, splint slightly short on the volar side such that folks can uh, really get that MCP joint flexing. Uh, if you're looking at your uh, plaster sheet head-on, it's sometimes helpful to uh, trim the uh, plaster sheet uh, from radial to ulnar, where it's a little longer on the radial side and a little shorter on the ulnar side, just based on how the metacarpal cascade sits. Uh, in any case, you put your after you do your reduction, which is usually a, a combination of uh, hyperextension, axial traction, and then you pull it up and over into flexion, uh, at, at least in this case uh, for a dorsally displaced distal radius, and then you end up putting your three-point splint on, well molded, and hold the splint until it uh, dries. Uh, and then after the splint is placed, make sure you obtain a, a post-splint x-ray uh, showing that uh, the reduction uh, occurred is acceptable, if that's what you're shooting for, and that there are no big fragments sitting in and around the uh, carpal tunnel. And then do your post-op neurovascular, excuse me, post-reduction neurovascular exam because you want to monitor for median and ulnar nerve uh, compression as well as to make sure there's no compromise of the uh, radial artery as you are, uh, as you have done your reduction. 
So after you've reduced the distal radius, you want to look at it and say, is this something that I can treat non-operatively or not? Again, I'm, I'm going to talk about the two millimeter articular step off. If you have a bigger articular step off, you probably want to start thinking about um, operative management versus non-operative management. Uh, if the radial inclination is within five degrees of normal, so within five degrees of 22 or 23 degrees, you can, you can get away with non-operative management. If your radial length is between two to three millimeters of the contralateral side, or the normal, which is about 11 millimeters, it may be okay to treat the distal radius non-operatively. Palmar tilt. In your, palmar tilt range is fairly wide. You can tolerate up to 15 degrees of dorsal tilt and up to 20 degrees of volar tilt. And this is sort of the border of how much you can tolerate. And so the, the range should narrow for your 25-year-old healthy architect. Uh, you don't want to tolerate uh, 15 degrees of dorsal tilt and somebody like that, uh, you can, in a 75-year-old diabetic who's uh, bed-bound, you can certainly tolerate 15 degrees of dorsal tilt. And then uh, articular step-off, again, like I've already mentioned, uh, uh, anything greater than about 2 millimeters uh, will lead to post-traumatic arth arthritis. Jupiter's group had shown that already. Um, factors that predict redisplacement. So if you've uh, seen an x-ray uh, where there's significant an initial displacement on the injury film or you're, it's an elderly person and they're 60, 70, so on, or there's extensive metaphyseal comminution, you better uh, worry that after you've reduced this fracture, and there's, a, there's a significant chance that this may uh, redisplace. If uh, all these parameters are met and you're happy with the reduction, uh, have the patient follow up in a week uh, so they can be transitioned to a cast for the remaining uh, four to five weeks. Uh, usually the uh, distal radius fracture can be treated with a short arm cast for uh, uh, about six weeks. Uh, if the uh, parameters are not met and uh, the plan is to proceed with operative management, uh, again, uh, you have a variety of options. Uh, but before you consider taking somebody to the OR, remember, think about their occupation, hand dominance, lifestyle, age, comorbidities. Um, and so this will, these are all factors which will ultimately come together and help you decide whether I should make an operative decision or, or not. And so the goal of uh, treatment should always be to get a pain-free, mobile, and stable wrist that is anatomically re reduced. And you can do that in a variety of ways. You can do a closed reduction percutaneous pinning with uh, various uh, K-wires that are left in place for four to six weeks underneath a cast, or you can put an X-fix on. X-fixes can be bridging, which means they go across the radiocarpal joint, or they can be non-bridging, which means they don't. Um, if, you're, if you are uh, opting to X-fix a distal radius fracture, be wary of uh, over-distraction as this is going to limit tendon excursion. And then you have uh, open reduction internal fixation uh, options, and that's uh, locked plating. Uh, you can go volar uh, or dorsal. Uh, and if you're going dorsal, usually it's between the third and fourth uh, dorsal wrist compartments. And then uh, if uh, you're not uh, satisfied with your standard uh, plating approaches, you, you've got fragment-specific plating you can do. So if you've got a dorsal shear, Fracture, you can put a, a dorsal ulnar specific plate and various companies design those things. And so here's an example. There's a, uh, a clearly a distal radius fracture on that uh, oblique and that AP x-ray there and uh, appears to be a, a fragment that's sheared off. Better seen here on the lateral, and so there's a volar shear pierce. I, I would argue that that is a volar Barton's fracture. Uh, the resident on call reduced it, put a sugar tong splint on. Uh, clearly, you can see that uh, the reduction is uh, uh, inadequate for non-operative management, so we're going to plan to treat this operatively. And so when you uh, treat a fracture operatively, uh, adhere to the AO principles, uh, anatomic reduction, stable fixation, preserve the blood supply, and in general just the soft tissue uh, in, in and around the area you're operating, and then early mobilization. So uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, how to go about open reduction internal fixation for that case that I just presented. Uh, have a preoperative plan before you go to the OR, so whether this involves uh, writing it down or, or having it in your mind, but uh, 
uh, exactly what kind of hardware you're going to use, the positioning, uh, instruments needed for reduction, and so on and so forth. Again, I'll refer you to Dr. Boyce's preoperative planning discussion. Loops are helpful uh, in uh, when you're operating in and around the wrist and hand, given the uh, size of the structures. Read the technique guide for any kind of hardware you're planning on using. So if you're going to use the Synthes Volar rim plate, uh, know that you can bend those tabs around the, uh, around the plate. Uh, or if you're using hand innovations or, or whatever have you, uh, it's helpful to know what your screw options are. And you may not have a scrub tech uh, who is savvy in the ways of that hardware uh, if you're doing this at an off, off time. Uh, examine the contralateral wrist prior to uh, prepping and draping your operative side. Uh, this helps you understand what the laxity of the DRUJ is, for example. Uh, positioning a supine, you can get an arm table and then make sure it's uh, radiolucent, obviously. And then get a tourniquet. Tourniquets can be placed sterilely or non-sterilely. It's uh, entirely up to you. Have bipolar electrocautery in the room for some of the small bridging vessels that will cross your field and then have a fluoroscopy mini uh, uh, C-arm or regular C-arm is perfectly appropriate. Uh, something our hand attendings do here is uh, use the beaver blade, and it's a small blade that has a circular tip at the end, and this helps, a semicircle at the end, and it, it helps you get finer control and uh, is a little blunt, and so gives you more control than if you were just slicing around with a 15 blade uh, in and around the radial artery. Your approach is uh, to the volar uh, distal radius is usually right over the FCR. This image is a courtesy of John Clovis. He's one of our rotating medical students here who was nice enough to let me draw on his wrist. Uh, that incision is uh, centered right over the FCR. Some folks like to cheat the incision just slightly radial to it. In any case, the length of the incision will be dictated by uh, the uh, fracture pattern you're dealing with. Uh, please obtain uh, preoperative fluoroscopy and mark out uh, the fracture site and uh, the distal articular margin of the radius so you kind of know how much exposure you have to do. The uh, volar approach to the distal radius is uh, uh, the uh, modified Henry approach, and that's the workhorse approach. The true Henry approach is between the brachioradialis and the radial artery. Uh, we, however, are going to go with the modified, which is uh, just next door to the radial artery in the other direction, and that is between the radial artery and the FCR tendon. Uh, things you have to worry about are, uh, in addition to the radial artery, are the uh, palmar cutaneous branch of the uh, median nerve, which comes off about five centimeters proximal uh, to the proximal wrist flexion crease, and uh, usually lives between FCR and palmaris longus. Again, uh, the modified Henry approach is sort of the workhorse approach to the volar distal radius. If you need to go dorsal uh, for a dorsal shear pattern or you need to do a combined dorsal volar approach in the case of a, a high energy impaction injury, then uh, uh, you'll have to go dorsal, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that for, uh, approach in this talk today. Uh, for the volar approach, I'm going to go step by step with you. And so uh, after you've uh, done your timeout, antibiotics are given and uh, the incision is marked out, then you inflate the tourniquet. You don't want to burn tourniquet time by putting the tourniquet up first and then realizing, oh, wait, we don't have our plate in the room or uh, we still have to do a timeout and so on and so forth. So uh, once your uh, timeout's done and the tourniquet is up, uh, take a, a skin knife, uh, come uh, over your incision. That should be already drawn out uh, with a sharp blade. As soon as you do that, switch over to a tenotomies and an Adson pickup uh, and spread down directly to the FCR tendon sheath. A mistake that I see uh, some of the younger folks do uh, immediately right off the bat is when they get tenotomies, they have a tendency to want to start spreading everywhere. Uh, you really end up delaminating tissue layers when you're spreading uh, haphazardly. So you really want to spread in line with your incision. So if my incision is running like this, I want to be down in there and spreading in line with the incision. If I'm in and making planes, Anytime I put a tenotomy in and I delaminate the skin from the deeper subcutaneous tissue, I'm destroying the uh, vasculature that goes up vertically to the skin. And so that's, uh, in addition to just uh, flat out poor technique, that's a, uh, uh, it's a devitalizing vital structures when you don't uh, need to do that. In any case, after you've uh, used your tenotomies and you've uh, found the FCR tendon sheath, uh, take the beaver blade and sharply incise the FCR sheath, which is just a thin, wispy 
uh, tissue layer and it will slide freely over the actual tenon itself and size it with a beaver blade and your FCR tenon will pop out through it. Get a retractor after that and, and have your assistant to retract FCR ulnarly. Then you're going to see the sheath uh, of FCR and, and that's the floor of the FCR sheath so you incise that sharply with a beaver blade and as soon as you go through that sheath the uh, robust muscular tissue of the FPL or, or the tendons of the FDP will pop through and usually there's pressure uh, underneath those tendons as well from the, from the fracture hematoma so you'll see those pop through. At that point uh, get a, a retractor in there. Here we like to use dull wheat lantern retractors. Uh, normal wheat lanterns have uh, very sharp edges and so if you are going to use those you have to be very careful because if you put them if you lower them past the skin and you deploy them, those sharp tongs can end up going uh, into the median nerve or going into the radial artery and you're causing excess damage. So use blunt tipped wheat liner retractors, deploy them once you're uh, deep to uh, vital structures and uh, once you deploy the wheat liner retractor you're going to be able to get a good view of the pronator quadratus and the pronator quadratus runs radial ulnar and so what you can do is then once you see it you can take your beaver blade and sharply take it off the radius and so uh, find its attachment on the radial margin of the uh, distal radius and lift it off and you can use a um, uh, wood handle elevator a periosteal elevator to lift that off after that you're going to be staring right at the fracture site and you can use a baby bennett retractor uh, baby homan retractors uh, and put one on the dorsal excuse me on the radial side and one on the ulnar side and, and really expose the fracture site so the exposure is done, you can irrigate it um, with uh, sterile normal saline. You can use curettes, uh, dental picks to clean out the fracture site, and then attempt a uh, trial reduction. And so in the cases of a dorsally displaced uh, distal radius fracture, you need to really flex the wrist down. Uh, if you have a volar shear piece, you need to put your thumb down on the uh, volar cortex and push that distal fragment up and over. Uh, have uh, fluoroscopy ready. And if you uh, are happy with your initial reduction, you can use uh, small K-wires, 4 or 5, and, and fire them down, retrograde or anterograde, entirely up to you based on uh, what your exposure is. And uh, I like to put a, a K-wire through the radial styloid down, prox uh, from, shoot it from distal to proximal. And uh, in this scenario, it's helpful to preoperatively have marked out where your radial styloid is on the skin so you don't have to fumble around and, and go around uh, uh, perforating vital structures with your K-wire, finding the radial styloid. So anyway, after you've uh, attempted your trial reduction and you, you like it, you've obtained the reduction, go ahead and pin it with the K-wires. And then after that, after you have your reduction, get your plate. And so whether you're going to use a broad, narrow, standard uh, plate, pick it and bring it in, lay it down over the fracture site, and position it where you like it. Uh, Focus just on how distal or proximal the plate is sitting initially. Uh, because if you put it too distal, that plate is going to then rise up along the incline of the distal radius. And the plate, if it sits up too superficial, it's going to end up irritating the uh, flexor tendons. So for now, just focus on the distal proximal placement of the plate. And bring in, as shown in this fluoroscopy image, uh, once you like your plate position in the distal proximal dimension, you can then mark uh, along the plate and along the radial aspect of the distal radius where uh, you want the plate to sit in the dorsal, excuse me, in the distal proximal dimension. Once you like that, then all you have to do is take that point and and pick the center of the distal radius in the AP plane, uh, medial to lateral, and uh, drill your screw hole without the plate. So again, let me reiterate. Once you've obtained your reduction, put the plate down, pick a screw hole in the shaft, and take your plate distal and proximal, and once you like the proximal distal placement of the plate, Take a marker and mark your screw hole uh, on the radial edge of the uh, distal radius. Then you know where your point is for proximal distal. 
and then you just take that point and translate it radial ulnar and, and center it right in the middle of the um, bone. Once you do that, you can take the, take the plate off and uh, drill your uh, shaft screw and then bring the plate back in and put the screw down. Once you've uh, lowered the plate down onto the bone, uh, perform your reduction maneuver again if, if it isn't already done and then you can reduce the fragments uh, onto the plate. Uh, for any kind of a Volar Barton type of injury, you need to uh, hyperextend the wrist and you can use a bunch of rolled towels on the backside and uh, push uh, with the plate. Uh, if you've got a dorsally displaced fracture pattern, then you're going to have to maximally really uh, uh, flex that wrist down so that that dorsally displaced fragment can then come up and uh, touch your plate. And then the name of the game at that point is to make sure the articular surface is appropriately reduced and you can use a combination of free airs or dental picks to really elevate the uh, articular surface. Once you like the, uh, how the distal articular piece looks, you can then uh, put K-wires in the distal uh, plate holes. And then uh, the name of the game now is to really start getting perches into that distal fragment. And so uh, let me uh, take a slide and tell you about the watershed line. And so in the uh, photograph, uh, all the way to the left, that's an oblique photograph of the distal radius. The photograph to the right of that one uh, shows you the volar surface of the distal radius. And look at the dotted line. That's the watershed line. And that marks the most distal edge of the epiphysis. And so you don't want your plate being any more distal than that because it's going to irritate the um, flexor tendons uh, and the plate that's shown that was already placed in that x-ray shows that the uh, plate is more proximal to the watershed line. Anyway, going back to our reductions, so after the reduction's done and the plate has been placed, you really start uh, uh, drilling into the uh, distal screw holes. And so for the distal screw holes, drill it by cortical and you'll have a guide that goes onto your plate and put a hand on the dorsal side of the wrist as you're putting uh, your drill in. And as soon as you perforate the far cortex, your hand's going to be there. You're going to get that feedback and know that you shouldn't be plunging anymore. Uh, take two millimeters off whatever your measurement was, and you can measure the depth of the, of the screw hole with either a depth gauge or just measure directly off the guide as you're drilling. Uh, in any case, if you've measured 16, put in a 14 peg or a screw. And uh, depending on where you've placed your plate radial and ulnar, you can leave the proximal ulnar screw hole empty uh, because uh, a screw placed there may irritate the DRUJ. Certainly long screws are uh, going to irritate the extensor tendons on the backside. Be wary of that. And then fill your shaft screws, which are um, about 12 to 14 millimeters in size. Finally, uh, uh, obtain uh, final x-rays. And so in addition to your AP and lateral, uh, look at the radial inclination. So if you know the radial inclination is 20 degrees like this, take an x-ray uh, fluoroscopy shot down in that plane so you can make sure that the screws are out of the joint and you know that the radius has a volar tilt of about 10 degrees in this direction. So make sure you fluoro in that plane as well to make sure that there are no screws in the joint. Uh, once you've obtained final fluoroscopy, irrigate with the, uh, your choice of irrigant, repair the pronator quadratus, over the plate. Uh, folks like to do that here, uh, not because of uh, uh, restoring strength of the pronator quadratus, but because uh, it's a layer of tissue that can then prevent irritation of the um, flexor tendons uh, from the plate itself. So with the pronator quadratus being repaired, you have a, a layer of tissue interposed between the tendons and the plate. Uh, then uh, let the tourniquet down, deflate it, and achieve a hemostasis, and then uh, sparingly use a 3-0 monocryl in the deep dermal layers. Deep, uh, monocryl is uh, uh, an absorbable uh, stitch that uh, absorbs through hydrolysis. Vicryl is a uh, braided suture, unlike monocryl. Monocryl is monofilament. Vicryl is braided and it absorbs through uh, an inflammatory reaction and so it's more of a red irritating uh, looking incision when you see it post-op in clinic. So therefore we elect uh, to use uh, monocryl. And so 3-0 monocryl in the deep dermal layers and then horizontal mattress with a 2-0 or 3-0 nylon 
and then a, a non-adherent gauze followed by uh, more gauze and a, and a soft roll followed by a volar slab splint or in cases where you're really worried about uh, uh, DRUJ instability, you can uh, place a uh, uh, long arm A-frame. If after your uh, fixation, you're worried about the DRUJ and the, you test the DRUJ by shucking the radius and ulna, uh, you hold the radius stable and you move the ulna back and forth and you do that in the neutral position, in the uh, pronated position, and then in the supinated position. If you're really worried about it, about the ulna falling out of the uh, sigmoid notch, then um, consider putting K wires across that joint. Finally, obtain post op x rays. Here, that volar fragment uh, that I showed you in the talk earlier has been reduced and fixed stably with this uh, uh, locking plate construct. Uh, here's another example. This is uh, clearly going to fall outside of the acceptable parameters as well. Given the degree of comminution, it was uh, reduced and splinted, but uh, again, the degree of comminution and the intraarticular step off is going to lead to this, and this was fixed with your standard volar locking plate. The plate is proximal to the uh, uh, watershed line. Again, I, I hope I've introduced some important concepts for you in this talk, and this talk uh, serves as a backbone for your preoperative planning and uh, can be a guide for uh, things to think about prior to heading to the OR. If you have any questions, you can certainly email me or any of my colleagues here at Vanderbilt. Mark Snoddy is our uh, resident who has a particular interest in upper extremity. Uh, you can always email him as well. Thank you.